The following podcast is a W2M Network original production. Visit W2Mnet.com for all of our other great podcasts, plus news, reviews, articles, and opinions from the worlds of wrestling, video games, football, and entertainment. You're listening to Wrestling to the Max. Alert, alert, clear all channels. This is an exclusive. How you like that? Sean Garmer and Paul Leeser. Some say watch this, I got this. Man, everybody watch this, I got this. Now somebody watch this, I got this. Man, everybody yeah. watch this as I be in my zone. Woo! Hold up, let it breathe on them. I be rapping on the track there with ease on them. Hey, hate it on getting away. Cause I be on my grind like every day. Woo, baby, yeah, I'm caught. Oh, I love when the fader doesn't work right. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, uh, to Wrestling to the Max's Fast Lane 2017 review. And yeah, the fader may not have worked, but guess what? That means we got in here quicker and to talk about this intentional, amazing, weird, odd, crazy show that we're going to talk about tonight. That's right. There's all those components involved in this year's Fast Lane. And this, is, of course, means that we are that much closer to WrestleMania 33. We hope you're excited because we sure are. We're getting involved in a lot of great content leading to that show. And so we're going to talk about this, and we're going to get into all the great stuff when it comes to Fast Lane. But before we do, I want to let you guys know, if you want to come find all our content, you need to go check out w2mnet.com that's right that's where we have all our wrestling to the max stuff all our shows of course all our regular episodes we do twice a week plus of course all those great review shows we do like raw smackdown live 205 live and nxt also don't forget i you know maybe you listen to us on itunes maybe you listen to us on stitcher or any other place guess what if you want to get us without even having to search us out every time you hear an episode Make sure you go subscribe to Wrestling to the Max or, of course, the W2M Network. That gets you not just us, but lots of other great content for your listening pleasure. Uh, But, you know, now that the plugs are out of the way and now that you kind of have some information under your belt, we want to make sure you guys get a chance to hear about this amazing show. Uh, So, of course, uh, I'm your host, Gary Vaughn. There was nothing amazing. The only thing amazing Uh, was how amazingly bad it was. Sean. Now you just ruined it. Now people just turned it off because they just said, oh, well, why do I need to listen to this? <laughs> I'm pretty sure they know how bad it was if they're listening to this. You always sell it, and then afterwards you crap on it. You, no. you always get people interested. Let's, if, let's okay. stop being so anyway, like WWE. I, I'm, all right, all right. I'll stop. Okay. So anyway, I'm your host, Gary Vaughn. Of course, that is Mr. Sean Garmer, who's willing to be negative. And uh, hey, let's talk about Mr. Paul Leeser, who's finally got a chance to get healthy. And this is so great. I'm so glad he's on tonight. Uh, Paul, man, glad to have you back, buddy. I, I picked a great night to come back, guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, of course, he, you know, we, we could be as negative as we want on this show. But at least this is the biggest positive thing is we do have I Paul I was on waiting for Paul to just go, you know what? I'll just uh, let, I'll see you again on Monday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, see, I'm just telling you guys, you can't sell the short because if you start selling things short early, people are just like, eh, you know what? They're right. Why am I even listening to this? We so, we so rarely complain on this show, though. Th- this has got to be a milestone at least. So that stick around for that. <laughs> I, you know <laughs> what? Actually, sometimes when there's complaints, it's sometimes an even more entertaining show. I mean, hey. When we complain about TNA, you can't say you, us laughing about something is not funny to you. Just... <laughs> it's true. It's true. Oh, man. So let's go ahead and jump into this thing, even if it is, you know, kind of lame, possibly, to whatever. There matches. are some good things about this show. It's just few and yeah. far in between. Exactly. So let's talk about one of the things I want to know how you guys feel about, and that's the biggest thing in the night, of course. That is the universal title match between Kevin Owens and Bill Goldberg. And, you know, we were expecting some shenanigans, and we'll talk about that. But I just got to say, you know, we started this thing out, and, man, Bill Goldberg went all the way back to 1998. We even have the cops with him tonight, or security, or whatever that is, bringing him to the ring like, you know, back in the old days. It's his good luck charm. 
Exactly. It felt so much like WCW wasn't funny. I mean, I, I mean, I was looking and making sure it was in 1998. Um, but you know, this was kind of a, you know kind of neat way to bring, of course, the excitement to that. And you know, Kevin Owens comes out. Um, but in this match, what you know, <laughs> you do, he comes out. Is basically, all he did. Come out. Yeah, basically. So, uh, you know, we get the actual match itself, you know, ding, ding, ding. Uh, and then you get Kevin Owens doing what Kevin Owens does, is hang outside the ring. Felt like 45 minutes, but it wasn't. Uh, and he finally gets back in, and when he's going to actually, you know, face Goldberg, you hear Jericho's music. Guess what? Spear, Jackhammer, one, two, three. You got Bill Goldberg as your new Universal Champion, guys. And, you know... We all figured that would be kind of what would happen. Of course, you're expecting that Jericho Owens match at WrestleMania 33. This is how it's set up. We all kind of called that. Um, but yeah, how do you feel, in Paul, now with uh, Bill Goldberg as your Universal Champion? I, I want to know how happy 1990s Gary is because he had to have catched a ride on that time machine. I, I did, Paul. I, I can't lie, man. I <laughs> really felt like it. I kind of wanted to go and you know. Uh, uh, I don't know. I, it was kind of neat. I kind of, I did enjoy it to a weird example. And what's weird about it is you guys hear me complain all the time about Bill Goldberg because I, I miss that. I miss that feeling. And finally tonight, I kind of got a little inkling of it back. It wasn't full force, but I did get an inkling back of the good old days. But yeah, I mean, now we got WrestleMania set up and everything for Brock Lesnar, Bill Goldberg holding that title. It's going to be at play. When Great, it comes to I can go to sleep during that match. That, well, yeah, maybe, but the Universal title is now up for grabs. So now, I mean, I think there's only one way it could go, but we'll, we'll get there. But what did you think about all this? I mean, you guys, I'm sure, have some opinions about this for sure. You, you know, the Internet is completely pissed off, and I'm curious as to why, because this was coming from three miles away ever since we saw what Goldberg did to Lesnar by a Survivor Series, because if Brock Lesnar is not going to last two minutes, there's no way, as much as everybody loves Kevin Owens, and that's why everybody's so upset, that WWE was going to let that. So, to be fair, they're sticking to the booking they created. This is the match they wanted. This is the match they're going to get now. And here we are. I mean, Jericho and Kevin Owens is going to be the story to follow out of this. I'm sure there is not a ton of of clamor to, to see Brock Lesnar and Goldberg hook it up once again, even if it is for that red belt. But I, uh, I'm i much more interested in the Kevin Owens saga. I mean, there, there's still good storytelling going on here. Jericho, who had helped Owens retain so many times, is now the reason why he lost the belt. So I, I there's story to come out of this, and this by far is the thing I'm least upset about on this show, just because okay. we knew it was coming. I mean, unless they were living under a rock, I think everybody knew that Goldberg was going to win. I think it's more about that. Take a stroll can... around Facebook, bro. <laughs> well, Facebook, you know, sometimes the uh, highest common denominator is not on Facebook. But uh, so I think people that are actually thinking about this, there is logical sense to be made that. If you're Chris Jericho, wouldn't you want to go for the Universal title? So why wouldn't you want to make sure that Kevin Owens keeps the Universal title? But, you know, maybe he thinks that the U.S. title is enough for him, and he just wants to screw Kevin Owens so bad he doesn't care. But that's that's fair enough, too, because, you know, like you pointed out, all the times Jericho's held him and then he... Festival of Friendship, and then, oh, man, that that big turn. So, you know, you can go think about it very many different ways. Uh, I think we all knew this was coming. We all knew that Goldberg was going to win. It's not a big deal. I think it's more about just like, damn, really, 20 seconds? All right. At least they threw the Jericho thing in there, so it's not, oh, like, well, Jericho came in. A lot of people were saying, oh, Jericho should have came in afterwards. I was like, well, okay. The whole point was that you're trying to sort of protect Kevin Owens in a way because he was talking so much smack, and then all of a sudden, oh, that happens. This kind of leads into the whole, that happened because of Jericho, and it makes it mean more. It protects both guys. It really does. And just for that reason, for Sean saying that, because of the fact that Kevin Owens does need 
to have that way of saying, look, I mean, uh, if it wasn't for Jericho, I could have got in there and I probably could have beat Bill Goldberg up, but it's just because of Chris Jericho. And now Goldberg, on the other hand, they've been protecting him all the all the way through, right? I mean, he hasn't had that much action. The Royal Rumble was his biggest action, and let's be honest, in the Royal Rumble, you just throw guys over the top rope. There's Goldberg has been protected lot. since 2003, Gary. He hasn't lost a single match in WWE ever. Why do you feel like, and even before that, in 1998, I would go way back then, he was still protected for the most part. He finally got a little bit more No, I mean, just, I never thought about that until they said it, though, that he'd Mm -hmm. never, ever lost a singles match in the entire, the year that he was in WWE. That's that's kind of crazy. Yeah, and I honestly didn't know that either. I I thought maybe somewhere he had lost something, but I guess not. And it's kind of funny to me. So that's the saga of Bill Goldberg, right? We all know here, sitting here, he's not exactly the best wrestler, you know, out there. Um, But he does his job of portraying a big, bad mofo. And that's what they did here, right, you know, tonight. I mean, they gave him the opportunity to look like he's big and bad, just like they did against Brock Lesnar. Now, once we do get to that Brock Lesnar and Goldberg match, now we can have a little bit more lengthy time, I would assume. Now, maybe they're going to do something completely different. Uh, I was about to say, I wouldn't, you you know. know. Well, even at that. I wonder if they try to have Brock get it back, right? Like, what if Brock just beats him in a minute 26? And I wouldn't have a problem with that, honestly. But I would like to see a little bit more from Goldberg. But you know what? It, a minute 26 is okay with me, too. I mean, I mean, they could shoulder block for a minute 26. It doesn't really, you know. <laughs> We've seen that already. We don't need that again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, would, I wonder if they would do that just to, you know, screw with the crowd or whatever. At, like, whatever time it is, midnight, Eastern time. Uh, By that point. <laughs> I honest to God hope not. <laughs> no, I, I don't think they're going to do that. But, you know, what we're looking at here, though, is a, really a situation where everything kind of set up the way it really needed to. I know the fans out there are upset. They wanted Kevin Owens, the younger guy, to get the victory, to continue on. But that does no, Goldberg no favors. That makes that matchup at WrestleMania between Bill Goldberg and Brock Lesnar even less. This had to happen. As much as it hurts, I get it if you're a huge Kevin Owens fan. And then trust me, I am too. I love Kevin Owens. I want him to be very, very successful. But guess what? Kevin Owens has got 15 years left in him compared to Goldberg's, what, two? Um, and that's that's stretching it if he wanted to pull that, at that far. So, I mean, this is kind of what we see in wrestling all the time. I don't know what the big deal is. But I don't know, Paul. I mean, I, I'm kind of happy. I feel like this ended up the way it needed to end up. Like I said, this is the booking they wanted to happen. This is like it makes sense in the complete context of everything they've been doing around Goldberg and around the Kevin Owens Jericho story. It's just a real shame that Kevin Owens gets shafted like this. I don't know if I'm necessarily happy about it, but this is what they've been building towards, and I got to give him credit for sticking to sticking to what brought him to this story so far. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Now, let's move on and talk and about kind, some, what kind of does suck too mm-hmm. is that they they did that whole the evolution of Kevin Owens thing for like two weeks basically. Oh yeah, like couldn't they uh, have just waited till after the turn and that's what causes Kevin Owens to become this cool sort of Kevin Owens that we kind of like? I don't know because I the the sort of coolness thing helps the Jericho story out. And I mean, I think that's by far what people are going to be much more interested in. So I, I I don't have a problem with them doing it this early. I mean, it sucks that it's not going to get the main event spotlight anymore. Uh, even though I guess it still could, because we don't know how often Goldberg and Brock are going to be around in the lead up to mania, but still, I I still think it's worthwhile. I don't know, but doesn't that just destroy everything he did though? I mean, because now Chris Jericho got him back and, he can almost make fun of him the rest of the time. He's back to being the the Kevin Owens goofy guy. If you're a good heel like Kevin Owens is, you will find a way to make this work. Because the great thing about heels is that they can be completely wrong and still believe in everything they're saying. And that's right. That's great. That's what he needs to do. Yeah, exactly. You know, and I'm, you know, I really am. I, and I'm super interested in what Kevin Owens is going to do with Jericho. That's going to be way more entertaining than what we're going to get with Brock and, you know, 
Goldberg here, but I, I still feel like, you know, it doesn't matter where on the card it is. I'm still going to be able to enjoy it. And, and I kind of feel like, you know, they still rely on Brock Lesnar and Goldberg to be headliners. That, that's what they're doing, and they're going to do it again here at WrestleMania. So let's talk about Sami Zayn and Samoa Joe. Now, this is one that started out the show, and uh, this is also kind of a conclusion I think a lot of us figured would happen, and that is Samoa Joe getting the victory. Of course, he submits, or and if you want to call it passing out, uh, you know, Mr. Sami Zayn there. Um, and the, the, the clutch there, I forget. I can never say it. I'm sorry. Coquina I have a kid, Clutch. Uh, Coquina Clutch. I, it's just like one of those Japanese names. I can never say it. My tongue tied. Uh, but, you mean... This is kind of what we expected, I think. I think a lot of us thought that Joe was going to get this victory. Um, I think also, I don't know about you guys, but I kind of felt like, you know, it was a pretty solid match overall. I, I really enjoyed watching, you know, these two go at it. I don't think it was probably their best match that you guys are probably seeing on the Independence or anywhere else between these two guys. But I, I thought it was a pretty solid match to start the show. I, I really didn't hate it. I kind of felt like... Uh, you know, it was kind of funny watching this match. I was watching Sami Zayn, and I thought, man, you know, he does such a good job for the guy that has to lose quite a bit here. I kind of feel like he's the Tommy Dreamer of what's going on right now in WB because he kind of seems like that guy. He seems to be tough as nails, but he just because of the punishment he takes. But not always the winner. Sometimes, but not always. I think the great thing about that analogy is that Sami Zayn is such a great baby face that you want to cheer for. And they have done a good job in that, whether they built him up as a threat or not. It's sort of inconsequential because, I mean, every time he's in the ring, you root for the guy. And they needed Samoa Joe to look strong and a great win. And that's what this was. Uh, and it didn't need to be the knockdown, drag out, five and a half star match that I'm sure people wanted. Because we're still establishing Samoa Joe as that guy who who murders you like for for 20 minutes 15 minutes however long this went he murders you for that long and that's exactly what he did here sammy totally got his licks in he still looks strong in defeat he didn't tap out all that good stuff but joe looks strong as all get out and that is what is important right now no matter whatever else they're going to do after this yep exactly uh i think uh the fact that we got a good match is important because it's one of the few things that was good on this show. And they started off the actual proper show with it, so it gave you a reason to be excited and tune in immediately if you like one or both of these guys. Uh, I think you, you got exactly what you, you know you should expect from this kind of match, just like Paul said. So, I mean, they delivered on that, and... And hopefully, uh, you know, I think the interesting thing is that they, uh, Nick Foley made a big point of trying to make Joe not be in the Universal title match. How great would it be if, you know, Brock wins and then Samoa Joe comes out and challenges him or kicks his ass or whatever. Mm -hmm. There you go. You turned it into doing something with a... He's not necessarily younger, but a new star. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. And, you know, what was so great about this is they put that emphasis on Samoa Joe. And they've really, you know, to my, so far, I have to say to this point, um, he feels important. And they, you can't really say that about a lot of guys coming in. Right now, I kind of feel like they gloat on him a lot. They kind of put him in the forefront. He's always interacting with the general manager. He's always doing things like that. Whereas, you know, some of these other people debuting don't get an opportunity. And they're really not made to look like, you know, right as they come in, threats to some of the biggest competition on the roster. So that's what I love about Samoa Joe. And they did that in this match. I mean, he, you know, may not have completely dominated Sami Zayn, but for the most part, he kind of did in a way. Um, and you know, the weird thing is, Sean, I mean, I, I don't know if you thought about this, but this being the actual first match of, you know, just the, the actual episode or the pay-per-view besides the, the kickoff match, 
I kind of wondered if this was going to be a situation where, you know, uh, Samoa Joe got involved later on in the Universal match. But when you saw the McFoley segment, you kind of got the idea, no. But when I first saw this match being the first one, I kind of thought that immediately. Yeah, it was uh, something that kind of crept up in my mind, too, because, you know, he's made a point of obviously wanting to to you know be at that top echelon and do that you know you got to be the the heavyweight champ or whatever i think uh the interesting the the interesting thing too is just uh the the crowd on this show was was hot for this so uh mm-hmm. they, and they were hot for the most part and you know unless they decided to have something boring on then of course they responded accordingly but you know, way better than Green Bay on Monday. <laughs> oh, man, yeah. Oof, we won't even get into that. I don't know why they keep going. I know why they keep going there, but God, give them a house show or something. Every time you go to Green Bay, it's just like, oh, everybody decided they wanted to take a collective shit on the show, no matter how good or bad it was. <laughs> Uh, that is true. Uh, of course, if you want to hear us really gloat on that, listen to that raw review. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you you trust me, we all hear plenty of it. Uh, let's go ahead and move on and talk about the tag team champions, uh, Luke Gallows and Carl Anderson. They faced off against Enzo Amore and Big Kaz. And, you know, this is one that I think all of us were kind of really thinking that, you know, this could be the opportunity for Enzo and Cass to get the championship belts, right? To get those tag belts that had eluded them for their entire WWE career. I mean, as they've been a tag team, I mean, they have never been able to reach the point of gaining gold. And we got a pretty decent back and forth. We get the normal formula, right? Enzo gets in there, gets beat the crap out of, and then Big Cass is supposed to come in and clean it up. It, it seemed like that formula was working. But it didn't completely come to fruition, of course, because, you know, Gallows pulls out uh, and, you know, you know, uh, Carl Anderson and all that stuff. So what we get here, though, in the end is Big Kaz and Enzo not gaining the titles. And you got Gallows and Anderson walking out with the fact that we do have something that kind of gives Enzo and Kaz some contention still. The fact that Enzo Amore had his foot on the bottom rope. So. This was not a clean victory for Gallows and Anderson. Still came out of the show with it, but I don't know. I didn't feel like this was an excellent match. This seemed like a raw match. I'm not going to lie. This seemed like a very much just something we've seen before. Nothing spectacular, but here you go. You know, I think uh, what you get out of this match is really something just to keep the angle going. Uh, I, I didn't overly have a problem with the action involved. It was It was... It's a little flat, but there's nothing wrong with this match per se. It's just not overly exciting. But the ending and the way everything goes keeps this feud going, which I think was the whole point of this going into Mania season. So Enzo and Cass still look like they could challenge because of the way the match ends with with, uh, with Doc messing with the feet that uh, Enzo clearly had on the rope. And uh, we keep moving on from there. But I... This was one of the more entertaining matches I think I've seen out of both of these teams in a little while, which may or may not be an indictment of the Raw Tag Team Division. Yeah, I agree. I mean, they did a good job with the the face and peril part with Enzo. They did, you know, they added some extra to it to make it last longer. The crowd got into it. You know, Cass got in, did the great, you know, man on fire spots and and all that stuff. I mean, I think. Uh, Carl, Gallus, Gallus Anderson looked good here. I, mean, I didn't have a problem with, with anything like you said. And just, I'm glad Gallus Anderson got to win. It wasn't just, mm-hmm. oh, let's, oh, they just won the title. Let's switch it off to somebody else or whatever. Let's make this thing something. But it's not like you can have, you know, I mean, yeah, it's still only one tag feud, really. But look, uh, you know, New Day is doing nothing till after WrestleMania. You really need to have some kind of established tag feud, and you need to have the heels have those titles uh, for that to work, really. Yeah, I, I mean, I definitely understand that, and I think that, you know, it really is true that, you know, it's it's better for, you know, Gallows and Anderson to have those belts walking into WrestleMania. 
the one thing I mean I'll just say is the fact that I think I looked at this as good but scary because I kind of see the impending doom for Gallows and Anderson because them winning this match to me kind of feels like eh, they're probably not coming out of WrestleMania champions. Uh, it's just the way I kind of look at it. And it, I guess it shouldn't be an indictment on this match because it really wasn't. I just want to throw that out there. That's kind of the way I felt. As they walked down the ramp with those belts, I said, well, this is at least a pay-per-view. You can do that. Probably not the next one. So, But, I mean, you guys are right. Not a bad match. I just, I don't know. It didn't seem over the top to me where I felt like this was super, super special. Um, but that's okay. Not all of those can be that way. Uh, you, get, you know, Sean, you just mentioned the New Day. So let's yeah. talk about the New Day. But they did have their little ice cream segment. Uh, Sean, I, I don't know. I, I'm really curious what you have to say. I kind of feel this, like this is a waste of this time. This was so bad. <sighs> I mean, like, I this had to be one of the worst New Day segments that they've had in a while. And it just started the parade of let's waste time parts of this pay-per-view that felt like Raw. I mean, like, you were right about that tag match, though. Like, I mean, from that tag match until you get all the way to Strowman and Reigns, it feels like Raw. So, I mean, that's not not good, but, you know, WWE doesn't care about that stuff anymore. But, you know, it's uh, it's just, look, it, it wasn't funny. The thing with Big E is... I get that I guess they're trying to make it seem like he's either on drugs or drunk. Or he's maybe he's bored of the pay-per-view himself. I, I don't know. But, you know, maybe, maybe it was his shot at being broken. Who knows? But, uh, honestly, look, I more power to New Day if they can get this thing over with the their faces on some ice cream pops. And they get that sold in stores. Awesome. Uh, and, and that, obviously they have to go the route of uh, doing T-shirts and then getting the ice cream, which seems kind of pro- kind of productive. I mean, they've already proven to you that they can sell food. Why do they need to go do this again? But whatever works. Yeah, I, I mean, the only really funny part about this was the fact that Big E seemed to be in love with the actual ice cream cart. Uh Outside of that, there's not really a whole lot going on here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I wouldn't mind owning the, you know, the ice cream cart. It, it is very colorful. I'm sure I could use it to sell, you know, plenty of ice cream. But outside of that, there's nothing worth anything on this. That, that's that exact item right there. The material item that that is, is more worth than anything that these guys did tonight. I feel like that ice cream should be sold at, like, Halloween or something. It's just, their faces are kind of scary looking. (laughs) They're not, they're not, like, you know, neither appetizing or cheerful in those poses that they're in. So, especially Big E's, it looked like he was trying to scare the hell out of you with that, whatever that is. Oh man! <laughs> no, it does. Halloween. Like, like that one where it the him in the blue and the things melting off or whatever. It's like you know, the monster of ooze or something. You know, it's just weird. <laughs> oh man, yeah. Hey, watch out the new Kamala. So, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. God, don't we'll give to... Vince any ideas. <laughs> no, don't. Yeah, please. <laughs> Sorry, I said that, Vince. Uh, I was saying someone else. Uh, but anyway, let's get past this New Day thing. It, it, was, just, it was worthless. Uh, I want to do want to talk about something I kind of felt like wasn't half bad. I really kind of enjoyed it. And you guys may hate it. I don't know. Uh, let's talk about the Cruiserweight Championship. And let's talk about the fact that Neville comes in and faces Jack well, Gallagher. So shouldn't we talk about the Cruiserweight, the other Cruiserweight match first? I, I, you know what? We can. I was going to save it till the end because sometimes we just kind of throw in the kickoff match at the end. But if you want to talk about it was actually uh, good. Well, let's talk about it then. Rich Swan and Noam Dar, they face off and they take on. Uh, I'm already blanking in my head. I need to look at my notes here. I watched it. I've already forgotten. Akira it, Tozawa. Thank you. And Swan against Noam Dar and uh, Brian Kendrick. Yes, Brian Kendrick. That's right. So, uh, but you know, 
yeah, you're right, Sean. I mean, talk about this match, what you liked about it. I thought it was for good. I, I mean, it was fine. I mean, they, I just wish they would let them. Look, I get that they can't go 100 miles an hour for the whole match or whatever, but the stuff you got at the end is what they should be doing for more of the match than what they do. You get what I'm saying? Like, you still get the half ass cruiserweight part. Like, oh, okay, well, we know we're going to have a dive segment, and we know we're going to have a part where we let them do their flying stuff, but other than that, you know, we're, we're not doing it. Now, I get it, like, you know, three of the guys in the match are not super high flyers, and then you got Swan that does do the flying everywhere stuff. But still, I just feel like you sort of do it sometimes and then sometimes you don't do it and it's i think that also kind of confuses the audience because you don't know what to expect from when the cruiserweights go out there yeah i i think you got a point there they're they don't know i think what to do with this since the cwc and and they've struggled uh, most of the time to really find it and if you're not going to let them do what makes them cruiserweights, then at least let them wrestle at a faster pace. Because the beginning, like, there, it seems like there's little excuse for them to be wrestling as slow as they are at certain parts. And and don't get me wrong, when the when the match or the style calls for it, then, then go for it. But I think your typical cruiserweight match needs to be faster pace than what you're letting them do. And uh, it's not working, whatever you're trying to do here so far. So I agree. The ending's fine. I, I a lot of the feuds are, are relatively interesting if you continually follow 205 Live, too. So they have parts of this down. It's just I think when it comes to keeping people engaged for longer periods of time, they really struggle. Yeah. And he only did it like during right before they're about to do the flying part. But the crowd, once again, got really into the ha thing. So mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and you, of course. You get yeah, and at the end there, I do like the you know that him and Rich Swan are both into it, right? So it, you know, it gets the whole crowd, everybody involved, and it's super baby face, and it's fine. I mean, it's it's a good thing. I mean, you need somebody who the crowd can interact with, especially in a division that does not have a lot that they can jump into. I mean, I think the other one maybe at the most, you know, the whole can you handle this? Can you handle this dance? But besides that. They just watch. They don't interact with the cruiserweights, right? Right. I mean, I can't think of anything else like anybody else does. Yeah, Jack Gallagher does some things that kind of get him excited. But, you know, that's it's as far as you can reach. I, you know, part of the reason I think I forgot about who was in this match is because it was it was a fine match. But it didn't mean anything. And that's the bad thing. I think if these would have been singles matches, they would have meant more. Because you know that you know each of these guys uh, in the pairings I'm talking about have something that you kind of want to follow, but as a just a tag match, it's just kind of I hate to say it, but kind of watered down for me because it's it's not like that they get to engage fully in the feud that they've been setting up. So I just kind of saw this as okay, you know, it is what it is. It's a cruiserweight classic, you know, kind of thing. But then again, it's not. It's kind of like a WB slapped on version. And that's why I agree with both of you guys. You guys said they need to speed it up. They do. They need to make the cruiserweight special. And as slow as they're going, the way that they're doing things, it's so unspecial that you just kind of, eh, it's there. And I don't like that. I, I want people to watch 205 Live. I want them to want to watch the cruiserweights, right? I, I think there's a reason, and, and you know, I have to watch some WCW again. But I remember back when the cruiserweight division was going on in WCW, I cared. There was a lot of great cruiserweights going on, and it was exciting to watch. And I didn't care who the champion was sometimes because I was so interested in, you know, is Juventud Guerrero going to win or is it Rey Mysterio? Who's going to win the cruiserweight title? And that's just gone. And they need to do that here. I think these guys are great talents. I just, man, I wish they'd focus more. Well, as they showed in the singles match, I think they do fine there. It's when they do other things. Mm -hmm. But yeah, these these tag matches, that's exactly what I'm saying. The water down, it just does not feel special. I don't know. Like you you said, like that Noam Dar and Swan is like very tangible. Mm -hmm. It was like barely a thing. 
that they did once. And that's supposedly... I mean, the only reason that it's there, it's because Swan is, you know, has his buddies with Tozawa, and Noam Dar is, like, the only other character on 205 Live, so they just throw him in there when they need a heal. I think when you look at the chief differences between what makes up uh, WCW's run with the Cruiserweights and WWE's run is that WCW, I think, had the opposite problem and that they had the right idea as far as the in-ring action went because, well, one, they had a lot of luchadors, um, which was the thing at the time, but two, um, they let them wrestle at a faster pace. That's why those matches were always so interesting. And granted, they were very different from what WCW was doing everywhere else, which was usually... A little, bit, a little bit more of a plotting pace um, in, in their matches. And uh, I think you have the opposite problem in WWE where they don't let them really wrestle at the faster pace, but they do have characters for them. Whereas WCW, they just threw guys out there and let them do their work in the ring, and that's what kept you coming back. So I, there are problems to both approaches, uh, and I don't think anybody's ever really found a great middle ground to make a cruiserweight division feel like it matters more than it should. But they're... I feel like they continually try to find the pattern. They just, they seem oblivious to what it is. <laughs> yeah. And maybe they're just lacking X division matches, right? Oh God. Oh. No. <laughs> well, I think also it's true is that it's hard because these guys wrestle so fast now. Like just the normal WWE guys, the heavyweights mm-hmm. and all, you know, like they all wrestle fast. They, they all, <laughs> have great moves so it's like what do you do <laughs> to really you know uh, okay yeah some of them can do flips and stuff but like brian kenner is not going to go out there and you know flip off the thing anymore that's on his character so like you know and i'd be scared for the jury to be doing that too much you might break something so it's like just you have to pick and choose you know and mm-hmm. you just got to be consistent with it that's their main problem is that they'll have flashes where they let them do something and then they'll go back to the, okay, well, you got to wrestle like everybody else. And it's like, no, you can't do that. Other than being in the big singles match where you're telling me it matters because you're supposed to get me excited, you know, like they did when they did the big dive and all the, you know, everybody got excited. But when they're being real slow at everything, Especially when you got a guy that you're letting him keep his nickname of Stamina Monster. He's not really getting to show that, you know? Yeah, that's true. You're exactly right. And, you know, that's just, it's a fall uh, for the cruiserweights right now. But, you know, maybe they'll figure out something. Maybe they can, you know, allow them to do more. It's just, I don't see it. I I have a feeling they're going to kind of continue on this path. Uh, it would take some really convincing, I think, if uh, it ever did happen. But let's talk about that match that we were just kind of getting into, uh, Neville and Jack Gallagher. And, you know, I, I think this was a lot better match. It was exciting, I think, at points. And you really got the opportunity to feel, you know, like, you know, the Jack Gallagher really was going to get the chance to be the Cruiserweight champion here. And you had, you know, some false finishes, things like that to really build up, you know, this whole intense feeling of man, who can do this and can he pull it off? And I, I just think it was a heck of a match and Neville does pull off the victory here. But if you ask me, Jack Gallagher really didn't lose. I, I think this sort of hits upon what we were talking about. This felt different from everything else on the show. And that might just be because we were bored to death by 30 minutes of nonsensical crap before we got to this. <laughs> but yeah. Neville and Gallagher really, I think they put on something we're talking about here because Gallagher brought his style to the table. Neville brought his. And Neville, I think, is so malleable to working with whoever he comes up with in this division. That's what makes him such a great champion right now. And... They really went out, like, there's there's a lot of strong style elements in this. You get Neville doing some flippies here and there. Gallagher even does a dive. And uh, I, I think all, everything they brought to the table just worked. And I, I, I'd love to see another match between these guys. This was great. And they had a good story, too. And not to, this, for me, was the match of the night as far mm-hmm. as in-ring action goes. Uh, you know, only Joe and Zayn was really the closest to it. Uh, but... You know, they had a nice story with the whole, you know, Neville goes to the outside because he knows that 
Gallagher won't do a dive, well, then they play that up so much so when Gallagher goes out there and does the, you know, back elbow to the outside, you're like, oh, my God, he actually did a dive. And and that's, you know, crazy. And then he goes out there and does a super back suplex. And the that headbutt there that comes at the end of the, my God, that man is, uh, you know, those those faux headbutts that uh, that Gallagher puts on certainly shocks the crowd and shocks everybody else. So you know it it certainly works for him, and uh, it, it's it's this was just great. I, I loved it. I, I loved the way that they work this and Neville winning. He has to pull out the red arrow because Gallagher pushed him to his limit so much uh, that he had to make sure he put him away. Uh, you know. I think this did wonders for everybody. Yeah, I think so too. And, you know, it, it was a lot of fun to watch. I mean, this was something that really made me proud for the cruiserweights because I think a lot of the, you know, people at home and, of course, the people in attendance were, you know, able to see that the cruiserweights have some great stuff to offer. And, you know, it, this was completely different than what the kickoff was. It, it really made you maybe want to watch 205 Live and, and really, you know, really focus on maybe what's going to happen with a Cruiserweight title. So I think these two guys were the perfect matchup to have in this situation. And, you know, we'll see. I don't know where they're going to go from here, per se. I, I'm really, you know, hoping what Paul was talking about, I think, a couple of weeks ago, Austin Aries, Neville. I hope that happens at WrestleMania. But, you know, Jack Allers proved something to me that he definitely deserves to be in that title hunt picture. And him losing here, to me, sure, it's a loss. But in my book, I still felt like he had such a great match in this uh, show that really he didn't lose. I think people are probably going to be behind him even more now, you know? Oh, yeah. But, you know, Gary just wants an excuse to keep looking at Austin Aries' package. That's That's what it is. You know it, man. He's, he's you know, <laughs> the greatest man on earth, you know, and the greatest package on earth, huh? Uh-huh. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> loves it so much, they got to keep looking at it, you know? Oh, man. You know, well, I'm hoping we get a chance to see it soon. You know, we'll see. Uh, <laughs> see, it, uh, see it every uh, week. I know, right? Oh, man. Uh, I could get worse, but I'm trying Raw, to be good. Rod will get X-rated every time he comes on. <laughs> yeah. But... <laughs> So, yeah. But, yeah. I don't know. Anything else you guys to go from here? I didn't want. To, I didn't know if we want to continue anything else with the cruiserweights. We can move on past this. But, yeah, so. let's let's move on. <laughs> let, let, let's talk about something that you guys loved on this show, and I know you guys were probably just at the edge of your seats. And this is when we're talking about Rusev and Jinder Mahal, and I know oh. you guys, if you saw the pre-show at all, they kind of talked to. And said so they don't want to be a tag team anymore. Of course, you know, this was during the pre-show. We got this inter, you know, interaction uh, between Mick McFoley, talking to McFoley, and they kind of had their arguments. And McFoley said, you guys can go have a match tonight. Just go out to the ring, blah, blah, blah. So these guys go out, and it's actually, you know, Jinder Mahal comes out, then Rusev comes out, and they argue, who's going to wrestle first? They have the little fisticuffs, and uh, Jinder Mahal knocks, I believe, Rusev over the railing or something like that. Uh, all that matters here is we got Cesaro versus Jinder Mahal. And, uh, uh, you know, Cesaro's a good wrestler, and he kind of makes gender better, I would say. Uh, Cesaro wins. I mean, what do you expect? Cesaro's going to get the victory. Uh, Jinder Mahal did get a chance to look decent, though. I mean, I can't lie. I mean, he did get his, you know, his in this. Uh, and so after that, you get Rusev coming in the ring, beating down on Jinder Mahal, throws him out. Big Show is Rusev's opponent here. And once again, you get a little bit of this, a little bit of that with Rusev and Big Show. Uh, I mean, let's be honest. Big Show was the one who looked better here. Um, And I don't know where they're going with that, but whatever. Uh, Yeah, so Big Show just pretty much takes care of Handsome Rusev. That'll be the guy that you're going to be seeing more on Raw is Handsome Rusev. Um, But yeah, Big Show wins. So really, Rusev, Mahal, both losers here. How did you feel all about this? I mean, it was just kind of there for me. Uh, I think there is uh, giving this way too much credit. Uh, th- this was insanely crappy. Uh, th- this was, 
a complete waste of time. I fell asleep during this twice, once during the original broadcast and twice when I tried to rewatch it, and I just gave up. Just gave up. <laughs> Somehow, Jinder Mahal made Cesaro boring, and that's that's a whole nother level of talent that I never knew existed. <laughs> You need to learn how to hit the fast forward button a little bit more, Paul. <laughs> You're like, this sucks. Fast forward. <laughs> you you got to give it a chance. And when I don't like, we're, we do a show where we talk about these things, and I like to have something to say. And yeah, you know, this uh, didn't really give you a lot to say other than it's just shit. <laughs> yeah, no, just oh. Uh, yeah, certainly it's uh, it's terrible. Uh, this. You know, stop hind. You know, gender. If you want to stop being hindered, you need to stop hindering our entertainment of the show that we're watching. That's what you need to stop doing, because because that's all you do is make me wish that you were not on screen. And uh, seriously, get off whatever gas you're doing, because I don't know. You did not look like that, like you know, three weeks ago. It's or so obvious. Like, give this guy a wellness <laughs> test already, so he can be off my TV. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! And yeah. Rusev looks so weird with the haircut. Like, I mean, maybe Lana likes it more, but it's just weird. It's just, uh, yeah. I mean, and then like, wow, we couldn't have buried Rusev some more. Just Big Show is just out there. I swear, if Big Show just winds up in the Battle of Royal again, and we're pushing him like this. What a disservice to poor Rusev. Yeah, especially with this new look, right? This new gimmick he's going to go with of, you know, I, I keep saying it because of what I've heard, but Handsome Rusev, I think, is kind of what they're kind of portraying here. Right, him yeah. More of a clean cut, you know, more of a, you know, cleaner looking guy. Well, but I don't if know it's what be him, that uh, Lana had on with the, like she's going back to the 80s or something with the, whatever that was. Yeah. That's true. But even though I do love the 80s, I can't lie. So, you go. Um, but, you know, I think, that, you know, this is a definitely a big shame, Sean, like you said. It, it, for Rusev to come in here and to get beat down like this, this does not sell me on that I should care about Rusev at all, especially even with this new look. And I just, oh, it just seems like a waste of time for Big Show to be doing things like this. But, mm. I don't know. We're going to have something to really hate, and I think we, we got our gold here. This is what we really, really hated, and this was just a waste of time. And I was joking about Paul hitting the fast-forward button, and that's our job is to watch the entire show, so we watched the entire show. But trust me, if you're listening to this and you've kind of not really watched the show, just hit fast-forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah just absolutely. Hit. You're not having to review it. You can fast-forward through it. You'll, you'll thank us later. Uh, so let's talk about something that uh, we can, you know, maybe I, I'm kind of, you know, still some things here. I'm not really sold that you guys are going to love, but we're going to get into some more of this stuff. Let's go and talk about the women's division here. And we're going to talk about Sasha Banks facing Nia Jax here. And uh, this is a match that really revolved around Nia Jax looking dominant again. I mean, it seemed like a majority of this match Nia Jax looked like she was just going to run right through Sasha Banks and it was going to be easy as pie. She was going to move on. Sasha finds a way to kind of get some sleeper holds on, some more of those submission time moves to kind of keep herself in this thing. In the end, though, it basically took a roll-up kind of bridge to get the one, two, three for her. And, you know, that was her escaping Nia Jax with a victory. And that's literally escaping with a victory. I think Nia Jax gets the opportunity to look good here, um, definitely. Sasha Banks, she hasn't had that opportunity in quite a long time. So I don't know that this victory makes me feel any better about what she's got going on. But, I mean, I've just got to know, I mean, what's your thoughts overall about this and Nia Jax not getting a chance to win? I, I think this followed a very basic formula, right? You have Nia look really strong and all this, and Nia... Um, continues to beat Sasha up for the majority of the match. Sasha gets in a little bit here and there and then pulls out the big win uh, out of nowhere, essentially, and getting the surprise victory. And, then, and that's that's fine. They, Sasha needs something if they're going to do this four-way 
I feel like this was probably the best outcome you could do between all that. Uh, yeah. It's uh, it's one of those where they're continuing the story ride right, of everybody's kind of beating everybody, so everybody can have a you know shot at the championship or or whatnot. So Sasha beats Nia here, makes sense. Nia already beat her once. I didn't think they were gonna have Nia beat her again, especially since Sasha's not injured. And it was like one of those fluke things, right? Just happened to pin Nia under the bridge. And I couldn't get out after dominating her for so long. It's it's fine. Yeah. You know, this is kind of like, you know, a situation where this is a total setup match, right? This just sets up what's going to happen with the women's championship match. And, of course, talking about that, Bailey, you know, is going to come in with a belt. And and Charlotte's going to try to regain it. And Charlotte's undefeated coming into this show on pay-per-views. She's never lost one. So it was up to Bailey to find a way to retain her title and beat the streak. Well, it happens here, but, you know, not for the fact that it's not a bad match. I think it's a pretty decent match for the both of them. I think they did a pretty good job. I was, you know, pretty pleased for maybe what I was expecting. Nothing grand, okay? I'm not saying it was a grand, but it was pretty good. Um, But you have the whole ending here of this match to be kind of, opted out because of the fact that we now instead of Dana Brooke being involved now we've got Sasha Banks being the one who gets involved uh, causes the distraction and that gives Bailey the perfect opportunity to win and so thinking this way you kind of got the faces playing heel type roles here in a way uh, and of course Charlotte has her streak broken so I don't know I mean I'm kind of happy that Bailey walks in as champion but this is so weird now. I I see where they're going with this, right? Sasha continues to be this imaginary or, or maybe a very real crutch for the reason Bailey keeps winning. It keeps all that going with Charlotte. You have whatever going on with, with Bailey there too. And this match was not by any stretch of the imagination the best that these two girls could have done together. And that's that's okay in retrospect of what they're trying to accomplish here, but I, I just I'm not overly invested in Bailey as a champion. I'm not incredibly okay with how this is how they ended Charlotte's win streak because of it's just sort of fizzles now. It's not really it's not really a big deal. And I, I don't know, you're sort of left with a whole bunch of a of meh instead of a whole lot of sizzle, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, it, this makes this again is like they're building up to a Bailey Sasha thing, uh, which I'm totally fine with because those two have history and we know they work really well together. If this means Sasha turns, I think that's going to do great for her too. I just hate that Charlotte or Bailey went through the whole thing of telling Charlotte, "Hey, don't have Dana Brooke out there." So Charlotte. Does her a solid, I guess you can say, and leaves Dana Brooke in the locker room, tells her to get off my ramp, even. And then Sasha comes down, and Bailey doesn't even act like she cares mm-hmm. that Sasha's there. And that whole thing has been hey, you can't win without Sasha showing up. You can't win without, Sasha. like, why wouldn't you at least be a little upset that Sasha came down or, or anything? You know? Mm-hmm. it's so weird and like I said this this is why it's so strange is for the fact that you've got this happy go lucky baby face that Bailey is and she, like Sean just said she has not acknowledged that Sasha Banks has done all this stuff that's considered heel type moves to help her win right so she wins the championship because Sasha Banks hits Charlotte with the claw, the uh, the what do you call it, the crutch, and then now she distracts Charlotte once again. So this is so odd. You, you know, if you watch Raw Talk, I'm not sure if anybody's out there who's, you know, if you watched it or not, but in Raw Talk, they had both of the girls on and they were talking about everything, but yet really never, you know, fully acknowledged that this is bad. That, you know, and so 
I, I kind of feel like, you know, they're trying to ignore it, but they're not. Uh, I think, you know, like Sean said, that they're going to find a way to eventually get to what's going to happen. Sasha Banks and, of course, Bailey. But I just, man, I wish they would acknowledge him more. Maybe this week, maybe, you know, at least the weeks coming up until WrestleMania, they will acknowledge it, especially Charlotte. I'm sure she's going to acknowledge it a lot. Um, but it, it just feels a little strange that they have not yet. I just also hate that you had Charlotte lose her streak on a pair view that means absolute nothing. Mm-hmm. Like, why does she not lose it at WrestleMania where it means more and you can build to the Sasha and Bailey thing still and Bailey wins it back only for Sasha to, you know, get pissed and and attack her or whatever just there's there's a lot of things you could have done i just i hate the whole you're building up a streak only for her to lose it at this random pay-per-view same thing with the the match before this ugh yeah yeah it is kind of frustrating in a way and uh, i don't know I mean, I, I hope this build from here gets better. Right now, I'm kind of on the whole train of, you know, why should I really care about Bailey being champion for her winning like this? And I hate that for her. I think she definitely deserves to be a champion, but just in this way, it feels weird. I hope that they do the next run with her as champion a lot better. Let's see. Uh, so, uh, unless you guys have anything else about the women's division to talk about, we are going to head on over and talk about our final match that we need to speak about. And that, of course, is Braun Strowman and Roman Reigns battling out. And a match that, I mean, uh, I think that we were all kind of curious how they were going to end. Um, both these guys got some good licks in. I think that, you know, for the most part, uh, they did a pretty decent job here. Uh, I enjoyed it, you know, to an aspect of... You know, I kept thinking Braun Strowman was going to win. I was just kept waiting for it, waiting for it. And in the end, guess what? Nope, it's the normal Roman Reigns' music has got to play somewhere. And, of course, he gets the victory, so it <laughs> can play. So there you go. But, you know, it, it wasn't without Roman Reigns getting a beating. you got to admit, he got a beating. And they just found a way and they found a formula that I honestly think worked. It wasn't great. I, I thought Braun Strowman should have won. But it worked for what I saw here. I got to give him credit for it. You guys might not, but I will. What What do you think about this one? I, I'm going to give him credit too. I think they played this as as best as they possibly could in the lead up to what they're trying to do. Braun, I still think looks incredibly strong because he got to kick out and look just as strong as Roman did in this case. And Roman gets the big win that he needs going into WrestleMania for his uh, eventual battle with the Undertaker. I mean, I think the pieces fall into place well here. The match isn't super, you know, awesome or anything like that, but it's fine. I think it gets the job done for what it needed to do. Yeah. Um, I just kind of... the the That first spear is kind of weird because it's just, like, abrupt and, you know, then Roman reaction is the right one but it's like you didn't really hit it full force and you know that so it's kind of weird that you act like it's like oh my god he kicked out of the spear well it's not like you went through and did the everything you normally do and we're all the way at the end of the corner and all that kind of stuff and i mean but braun got to look strong you protect you protected him a bit and i thought braun looked good here and the, the power stunt to the table was a cool spot and I thought for what they did, it was it was good. You know, the Big Show match is still better, but th- this was good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you know, it's just a, a positive thing that we can all sit here and say it was a good match because I had a lot of fears. I, I kind of was afraid we were going to get what we've seen on Raw. What was Roman Reigns with fifteen Superman punches? You know, I felt like I was watching a, you know a Nintendo sixty four video game. But no, that's not what happened here. They actually mixed it up, and it wasn't all about the Superman punches. It was about both these guys fighting their hearts out. 
And, you know, in the end, Roman Reigns gets the victory, but it's not for the fact that he didn't take a beating t- to get there. So, uh, solid overall. So, we're, we're pretty happy with that. And, and at least, you know, I'll have to say this. It wasn't Roman Reigns' music playing at the end of the show. It was Bill Goldberg. So, at least we can say that. Uh, yeah. yeah so. <laughs> oh, that makes it so uh, much better. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I guess we got to take the good stuff with a lot of bad stuff. Yeah, which is, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, well, and that's another <laughs> thing, too, was my, my point of, like, I get it, Roman's about to face Undertaker and everything, but it's just, like, you beat the mountain of a man like that on Fastlane. God. Yeah, and, you know, I want to mention this, too, since you brought that up. You know, he mouths at the end, you know, this is my yard, whatever. And they bring that up. Jerry Lawler brings it up on Raw Talk with Roman Reigns. But it, it's funny because they won't really acknowledge the Undertaker talk just yet. But th- they do keep you know, using it. So I'm sure we will see it's tomorrow. It's one of those you know, nice little Raw. nuggets for hardcore fans. It's okay. Yeah. So we'll see. Uh, I'm sure on Raw we'll see Undertaker or something. At least in the near future we will. Uh, but yeah, let's go ahead and sum this thing up. We have to give this thing a rating overall. And I, <laughs> boy, am I excited about hearing your guys' rating. Uh, so, Paul, give it to me, man. Uh, I think we're looking dead in the face of the definition of a Bret Hart special, guys. Uh, opener's good. Cruiserweight title match is good. There's some other fine pieces of business on here that continues the story, but there is a whole lot of not good on here to go with the okay and that's not good. Plus, I fell asleep twice. That's um, <laughs> it's never good. So, uh, a four out of ten. That's exactly where I was going. Four out of ten as well. I mean, you got the you got the cruiserweight stuff, which was probably the highlight, especially if you put in both of them. And then you have the good Joe and Zayn match, the Strowman and Reigns match wasn't too bad, and until you got to the finish. Charlotte and Bailey wasn't too bad either. But then you got a whole lot of just whatever on here. And that's not what, something you should be saying for a pay-per-view. I get it. They're kind of half ass in it because WrestleMania is the one that matters and everything. But it's just, look, uh, the record of Raw pay-per-views has just not been as good as the SmackDown ones, honestly. Mm-hmm. You're not lying about that. And you know what I want to say is this pay-per-view, Fast Lane, to me, was just Sunday Night Raw before we get to Monday Night Raw. And, you know, the same exact things that you guys just mentioned here are the same things we kind of talk about on Monday Night Raw when we rate those. And it's there is a lot about a uh, kind of stuff that we could have done without, and a few things we you know enjoyed, and then maybe one big thing that really kind of felt like man that was good, and sadly that was the case on this show. And you know I, I would like to rank it higher only because of Goldberg getting the victory here, and just because of my old nostalgia. But I'm not going to let that affect today 2017 I, i'm going to give you the hat trick here i'll go four out of ten as well i think you guys are right on the queue on that and you know we got some good stuff but not enough to really put it over the top and to put it even past a five so and that's really really sad really i wonder if is, that's so. the first time we ever rated something all the same there oh. probably has been I just can't think we've, right now. I think we've done a lot of hat tricks before i don't think we've done a hat trick of this level of badness <laughs> yeah, exactly. Usually it's some positive, right? Eight out of ten or nine out of ten, right? Uh, so this is not a good hat trick, trust me. If you're throwing your hat, you're not throwing it very far. Yeah. Uh, so um, it's not be one of those times throwing the octopus, might. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. I like that one. Uh, but yeah, well, that does it for us tonight, everyone. Uh, this is our fast lane review. Um, W2M, of course, will continue this next week. If you want to hear us talk about the fallout from fast lane, go check out our raw review, which will be happening Monday night, along with our first episode, part one of episode 237 uh, that'll also take place Monday night. So you'll have two great shows to get into. Lots of big news that's happened over the weekend and the week that we need to get into there. And of course, we'll have our 
part two on Thursday, along with all our other great review shows we'll be doing. So you need to go check out all that content. Don't forget, go subscribe to Wrestling to the Max. Go subscribe to the W2M Network. And, of course, never, ever forget to go check out W2Mnet.com. Trust me, lots of great stuff there. Uh, we just added a huge entertainment section. Uh, a lot of content just got put on there. So we're really looking forward to you guys going and checking that out, of course, along with the other great content, wrestling, and, of course, uh, some other cool stuff. So don't forget to check that out, the video game section as well. Uh, but, yeah, we are done here. We appreciate you all joining us. And, of course, we will see you guys later on. Until then, if you're not living life to the max. Not living life at all. You know it. Please. Later. The following podcast is a W2M Network original production. Visit W2Mnet.com for all of our other great podcasts, plus news, reviews, articles, and opinions from the worlds of wrestling, video games, football, and entertainment.